you have your Bible this morning, turn with me to Matthew chapter 27, verse 57. Matthew, <clears throat> excuse me, Matthew 27, <clears throat> Matthew 27, verse 57. And when it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who also was a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus, and then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in clean linen shroud and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had cut in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there, sitting opposite of the tomb. Well, Matthew, uh, again, in this uh, phase in his uh, writing of the gospel, has uh, kept the details uh, short in uh, these just four or five verses here. And uh, regarding the... Uh, uh, burial of Jesus, uh, but uh, he does uh, give us some uh, some interesting things if you look into this in uh, a little more depth this morning. Uh, this guy uh, who you may have heard of, Joseph of Arimathea. Arimathea was a town that was uh, not too far away from Jerusalem, close to Joppa, and uh, his, this man's name is Joseph. He, the Bible says here in Matthew that he was a disciple of uh, Matthew also tells us that he was, he was wealthy, uh, and uh, this uh, fact adds to the uh, confirming, as I believe Matthew's point in making that note is about the fact that in Isaiah it tells that uh, the, this uh, Messiah would be uh, counted with the wicked and uh, buried, associated with the rich. So this was a fulfillment of his previous uh, death on the cross with the two uh, thieves and then uh, his uh, burial here in Joseph of Arimathea's uh, tomb uh, fulfills those two aspects of it. Mark uh, tells us that Joseph of Arimathea was a uh, member of the Sanhedrin, the council. Uh, Luke tells us that he also uh, took a position of objection regarding uh, the conviction of Jesus and the, the the whole idea that they were trying to do that. And John adds one more little detail uh, that he was a secret disciple, uh, meaning that his his uh, he wasn't rec recognized by the council at least or others openly as a disciple of Jesus. And uh, that uh, and again, some people say, well, if he voted against them. Doesn't that mean he was a disciple? Not necessarily. It just means that his position uh, in that vote was contrary. And I think there would be times when they had council meetings where these uh, 70 people on the Sanhedrin would not all agree, but that didn't somehow mean that they associated them with whatever the subject was. So, But John's gospel says that he was a secret disciple, meaning that John, uh, understanding of that, that, G that Joseph Marathia was a follower of Jesus, and, uh, uh, you know, more than just a casual. One of the things we learn uh, there about the next verse, which is very short, is that uh, these uh, crucified people, he says he asked Pilate for the body and Pilate ordered to be given to him. It's kind of short to the point because, again, Matthew's not trying to uh, deal with all the min minor details here because he's focusing this gospel on a, Jesus as a fulfillment and things like that. But there are a few things we, you can look at others and look at history and see that normally uh, they were left on the cross uh, by the Romans because they had no regard for Jewish religious practices one way or the other. Uh, Jewish law, of course, going back to the book of Numbers, uh, said that a person could not be left hanging on a tree overnight. And uh, if, it, if it happened, uh, they would have been considered uh, defiling the land. Uh, also, that uh, <clears throat> that usually the usual practice among the Romans for crucifixion people was that the family members could petition or claim the body of the person at some point. Uh, however, there is some uh, indication that in case, high crime cases like treason, which is what Jesus was accused of, of a sort, that uh, they would not necessarily grant it. The whole idea that Pilate granted uh, Joseph uh, the body of Jesus, probably two things play in there. One, I think Joseph was a wealthy 
person in some, of, of influence and was known to Pilate at least as somebody important. And Pilate was a politician before he was anything else. And so he probably felt like that, that there's already enough controversy and uh, that this would be no problem. And second thing is that uh, <clears throat> Pilate knew that the majority of the Sanhedrin and the particularly the, the chief priests uh, did not uh, did not uh, like Jesus and this whole thing was a sham. I think Pilate was clear that it was a sham deal and that he was being railroaded to put it in a term Jesus had been. And so I think it was a poke in their eye. I think he was just doing it to aggravate them uh, in my mind, at least anyway. Uh, so furthermore, Matthew doesn't say too much else about this. He doesn't mention it at all, but but here, but anyway, at the time, uh, there was some in the other gospels indicate that Pilate wanted to be sure he was dead because it was not normal for somebody to die this quickly. Uh, and uh, sometimes they had been, historically, there have been some counts where people had been there for eight or nine days. And they usually left them there to be scavenged. And so this was as a further you know, indication of something you didn't want to do. But in any case, Joseph was granted access to Jesus. And it was important that he be buried quickly because this is Passover uh, week at a festival coming up. And they were uh, on a Friday afternoon. Jesus dies at about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, and so the new day, the next day, the Sabbath day would have started on, a, on a 6 o'clock. And so it was important to get things done quickly so as not to uh, violate any of those kind of things. And so... Uh, this was something that he compresses. If you look at this whole thing here, he talks about the, uh, he gets his body, wraps it in a shroud, puts it in his tomb, kind of zips right on by what, else, what other things that were going on that other gospel writers, if you read the other parallel accounts, will tell you that there was some preparation and some other things going on, but it all happened really fast because of the time of this. And these women who are standing by here, uh, were, uh, were instrumental in some of that as well, someone else that will come up here in a little while when we talk about it. But what I want to get to for us is that I don't want to overlook this Joseph of Arimathea and what he did in taking asking for Jesus' body. Uh, just the fact that he went to Pilate and asked for his body is a huge risky thing. Uh, he is who he is, uh, Joseph is, He's a well-known person. He was a member of the Sanhedrin. He was wi widely to be that. He had to have some influence. He had to have typically some wealth. He had to be uh, somebody that people looked to. So he was known and he had a reputation. And to go after this person was a huge deal. Because after all, Jesus had been accused of, of uh, treason. So it was important. And so we need to keep that in mind. So I want to take that aspect of this and see if we can uh, help us today understand what it means to claim Jesus. What does it mean to claim Jesus? What does that mean? Well, claiming Jesus is not just saying his name out loud, spelling it, or saying that there's you, met, you heard of some guy named Jesus. It's the, the word, the, the idea of claiming Jesus is to identify with him. And that goes a little further to say that when, when one identifies with him correctly, as the Bible teaches, we have come to be a disciple of his. We have, we've accepted his claims. We've accepted his, uh, his offer of salvation. And uh, because we have repented of our sins, realizing he's the only one and the only way to heaven. And so therefore we have done that. And so when I say this, what I'm talking about here, I'm talking about people not just people who say they something, but people who have genuinely claimed Jesus as their Lord and Savior in all aspects that the Bible teaches. That person is now, I'm identifying a Joseph here with us in that sense or with those who have done that. And the first thing you'll find out is there's always risky when you identify with somebody who's hated. <laughs> I, 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 I honest to goodness tell you that you know, that, that we live in a world in a time when if you can't find a good example of that, you just ain't been paying no attention to anything. Uh, I don't, I will not equate anyone on this earth, past or present, 
with Jesus. So don't get me wrong. Don't don't you know start talking about how you know the preacher said. Well, you know, you hate somebody. You're hated because you identify somebody. It's like they're like just like Jesus. No, I didn't say they were like Jesus. What I'm saying is, Joseph identified with Jesus, and Jesus was a hated person by the by the Jewish religious establishment. He was hated by many people of the population because. Of they followed along that line. They didn't see the, the aspect just like it is. And quite frankly, Jesus has been hated by people uh, ever since and before. Uh, and even in a sense, he, you know, the Old Testament people going against God. Uh, that's what it is to hate Jesus, to to deny him who he says he is in the Bible, deny that what God has said about him is to hate him, is to is to deny him and put him. There is no in between. I know that people like to think that there's some place in between with Jesus, but there's not. There is no place in between. You either you either love him or you don't, and if you don't love him, you hate him. There's no in between. There's no neutral ground here. There, as I've said many times, there's no Switzerland. All right. So Joseph took a big risk to do this, and today, if you identify with Jesus, you are taking a risk. You're identifying with a hated person. Why is Jesus hated? Well, that's awful strong, Robbie. Do you think that's... Well, Jesus was hated then, immediately, in the immediate sense. He was hated as a treason. He was executed as a treason, one who tried to overthrow the government. Right? That's what the Romans used as their excuse. The Sanhedrin and the chief priests, the religious establishment of the Jews, hated Jesus because they thought he was trying to overthrow them. He was trying to usurp them, to to put them out of business, to change their way of doing things. And that would be probably a true statement. Uh, he wanted people to recognize that, that they were wrong. Jesus wasn't trying to take their job. He already had it. He was already in charge. You, you understand this? This is one of those things where it's interesting. You know, Jesus was, people say, well, he's trying to, no, he wasn't trying to take the job. He had the job. He knew who he was. They just didn't know who he was. That's an interesting thing. I tell people all the time, you know, God knows who you are and he knows who he is. You just don't know. And he'd love to let you in on a secret about that. You're a sinner who's fallen from grace. You're a person who has sinned and fell out of relationship. And the guy that you're fell out of relationship with knows that. And he'd love to help you fix it. Kind of like somebody called you up on the phone and said, hey, your house is burning down and I'm the fireman. I'm sitting out front. Would you like us to put the fire out? No, my house ain't burning down. And no, you're not a fireman. And thank you, I'll take care of my own business. And get off the phone and leave me alone. Okay. And they park out there in front and wait and watch and say, well, somebody said, well, why didn't you put out the fire? Because they didn't want me to. This is how God works. He's offered to do it. He has all the means and method to do it and would gladly do it. And would do it better than you could have, anybody else could ever do anything. He can fix it. But if you if you don't have if your house is not burned down and it's not burning down, and you don't believe it, and you won't listen to him, and you won't let him help you. Then guess what? I've met a lot more people who would agree their house is burning down than I would that God would put the fire out for you. And uh, I know there are a lot of people who who deny God, but I'll tell you what: there's a plenty. Of, there's not very many people who would deny that something's wrong in their life, or has been, or is, or going on. Now that doesn't mean they would say it right out in public, make a big speech about it, but they would. So anyway, Joseph comes to Jesus as a disciple, and he wants his body, which was a huge deal, and he exposes himself as someone who cares about this treasonous and this insurrectionist and this. Uh, blasphemer, right? And so therefore, he is running the risk, <laughs> I say it's a very strong risk, of being considered the same as Jesus, a hated individual. You can be hated because of your political party. You can be hated because of your political policies. What does that mean? You may not be associated with a particular group one way or the other, but you have a policy. You, you don't like the way that the, somebody's doing something, the government's doing a thing, right? You don't like their policy on that, and you don't like that, and so you're hated because of that. You're hated because of your denomination. You can be hated because you're a Baptist, a Southern Baptist. You know, the, uh, I know Baptists that, that uh, think Southern Baptists, you know, they don't, they wouldn't say, they, they think the word hate is too strong, but they, you know, they think we're all doomed and going to hell because, well, whatever reason, they got half a dozen reasons. I've heard several of them. 
But the point is, and you may be hated because of your denomination, your association in that sense, your religious uh, affiliations. You may be hated because of your geography. What does that mean? Because you came from this place or that place, from the south, from the north, from the west, from the east, from some other country, from somewhere else. You may be hated. People may hate you because of your geography. They may hate you because of your school. <laughs> you, you know, you're, a, you're associated with some university or some school. They hate you because of your this, right? They may hate you. They may, they may hate you because of your music. You know, churches, this is not this is not just a world, this is churches. You know, one kind of music they hate, the other kind this is this is very religious and spiritual, this kind of oh, is heathen, right? They may hate you and more particularly more hate you because you're a Christian. Because Christians represent what? Well, in their mind, a Christian is a judge. They're going around judging people. You know, looking at people and judging that their salvation. And somebody, I, I don't know how many honest and sincere people come up to me and say to me, you know, it's happened recently. Says, look, you know, I don't, I don't want to judge anybody. And I, and, and I said, and, and I said, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to judge. And the Bible teaches that. I said, look, the Bible doesn't teach that. What? I said, says judge not lest you be judged with the same measure we measure. You know, what does that mean? I said, well, what it says is the only thing that we're not to judge and that we have no ground no standing is is to judge the salvation of another person that's between that person and God that's God's business he's judging that I said did you judge whether you want to come to work this morning did you decide where you're going to the front door or the back door did you decide what you're going to eat decide what you're going to put on decide if, if you thought something was wrong or right this person was in law enforcement so you decide this you decide that yes you're making judgments all the time whoa whoops you're in big trouble with the Bible man that's what you're talking about I said, in other words, the Bible doesn't say that. It says we, we have, we're supposed to discern. I said, that's just a fancy word for judging. We're supposed to decide. What does that mean? That means that's a fancy word for judging. So we all judge things. I said, the Bible just says we don't want to judge something that's outside of our uh, domain. We have no understanding of that. We're, we're not able to judge other people's salvation. Doesn't mean we can't judge, make a judgment about whether we thought they were doing a right or wrong thing or what the Bible teaches. That's what he says. Look at the Bible. It, it wants you to look, decide. Choose you. I said, look, look you like the Bible. He, the person confessed by. I said, listen, Mateen, you believe the Bible? Yes, absolutely. 100% of the word of God. Yes, I said, it said, to, did God not say to Joshua? Joshua not say to the people, choose who you're going to follow? What are you going to do? What's that? That's a judgment. A choice is judgment. Why? Because it's judging between this or that. Decision is that these are all words that, that mean the same thing. I said, so just because somebody doesn't say, I judge you, does that mean you're judging them? No, we all think, I don't have to, you know what? I can stand in a room and somebody can say, like me, introduce you to Pastor Harris. And suddenly I can change. I can see their faces change. When I'm just Robbie, nobody says anything when I'm Pastor Harris. Whoa. Well, I said, people curse around me. You know what they do? First thing they do after they curse, they turn around and apologize. I said, which is not, I said, I'm not critical of that. I said, you know, they probably, we probably, none of us should do it. I said, but somehow or other, they can curse around anybody else, but they can't curse around me. I said, this is interesting. I said, this is a judgment. They judge this wrong to curse around me. It's okay to curse around other people, right? So I said, you know, this is one of those things. So, you can be a hated for identifying as a Christian because Christians have biblical perspective on things in the Bible. The Bible teaches certain things are right and wrong. I'm not going to sit here and argue with you about what they are, or, you know, but I'm going to tell you that there are absolutely things in the Bible that are right and wrong. There are the right things that do things and there are wrong things that the Bible talks about and there are consequences and so on and so forth. And a Christian uh, re recognizes this. Now, I said there are plenty of people who claim to be Christians who may say that they this is the Bible says this is wrong, but it's not. So what, what do you mean by that? Well, they come up with all kind of loopy ways of coming around to it. What they're trying to do is trying to justify something they're doing that the Bible. And that, so then other people just play out and say, oh, I don't believe the Bible. They can't be a Christian and not believe the Bible. They can't be a Christian and, and really and claim that, that somehow that it's possible without the truthfulness and the accuracy of the Bible because how did they find out about this? 
How do they know what it takes to be a Christian? When did they find out what it means to be a Christian? How do they have a clue? But if you have no foundational principles and you're floating like a cloud in the sky, you go where you want to, do what you want to do, and it works out. Some people can be uh, hated because they're evangelical Christians. I noticed that. The, the news always uses that. They're, you know, because they, the news being the news and the television people the television, they, you know, they've got it divided up. So they need to come up with some division here because there are certain people who claim to be Christians that, that believe certain things. Certain people who claim to be Christians believe other things. And some of these are of no consequence in re, as far as, uh, you know, going forward. There may be difference of opinion and all that kind of stuff, but they're not consequential in the ultimate role of salvation. But some of them are. Evangelical Christians are people who say, General, I'll, I'll summarize this really short version here, are people who believe that, that the good news is God came to forgive our sins of which we have all done. And therefore, there is no other salvation other than in God and in through Christ as God represents himself to us in Christ and says that that is he's the way, the truth, and the life. And nobody gets to God, the Father, except through him and through confession and repentance. And that we're supposed to, furthermore, we're supposed to tell people about that in a, in a positive way, try to help them understand that that is necessary. That you can't be born into a family. Some man can't come and pour water on you, say some magic words over you. Declare ye, you can't sit in enough pews or give enough money to get that to work out. You have to be, and that we're here to tell people that, that we are all sinners and there's good news. God is willing to forgive us if we're willing to admit it. And, and we feel like we have an uh, obligation to tell people about that. That's evangelical Christians. Now, there's more to it and deeper and complicated and all that kind of stuff, but let's just say that. Well, that makes us different than the people who are Christians because their mama was one. Somebody said they were. They said some words. They ate some food. They did this. They did that. Or they just self-declared. Sounded pretty good, too. So then that way they can do it. So you might be hated because you're that. You might be hated because of your Bible. Because you even read a Bible. Everybody knows it's fake. Everybody knows it's a myth. Everybody knows it's you know, lies full of lies and contradictions. I always ask people these lies and contradictions. They don't really know what they are. I always love to argue with people or debate with people who have no idea about what they're talking about. It makes the game, it makes it really, I, I apologize because I have fun. Sometimes I know you all know that here, but some of you may not. I mean, don't you just love to uh, have people start telling you stuff they have a no clue? They think that they're faking you out. And you're the person who knows what's going on. You know what's true. You know what the Bible what it is. And you know they don't have a clue because their questions are even out in left field. They have no clue. And so you're just waiting. If you're like me now, if you're not like me, praise God, because that's good. Thank God for the people who are not like me. You're waiting for them to stop long enough to ask them, where did you read that at? What, 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 what book in the Bible is that? Where, where does it say that? And you know this next look. Uh, and they're looking like it's on the floor. Or they may look up at like my brother used to look up at the ceiling like it's up there. Where is the answer? I have no idea. Where did you, when, when did you read that? How, do you, how, where did, how did you come to that conclusion? Well, I said, did you read the Bible? Have you investigated, looked into it? Well, no, I haven't done none of that. But people... Ah, you have some people. Okay, good. Okay, now we get to the bottom. Okay, so you can be hated because you've identified with Jesus Christ. Be prepared. Joseph of Arimathea had already made this decision. He had knew what was at stake. So we shouldn't be shocked. Or under By the way, let's go a little further. Joseph of Arimathea was about to take possession of of a dead body. Jesus Christ was dead. Jesus the Christ was dead. The Bible says he was dead. He was dead. He didn't faint. He hadn't passed out. He was dead. Dead, 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 dead. Or he had passed away or he was late. I don't know what other words people like to use for dead. He was dead. Okay? He was about to take possession of a dead body, which was a huge problem for a person of any kind in Jewish consideration. Why? Because he was going to become unclean. That meant for seven days, according to the book of uh, Numbers in the Old Testament, that meant for seven days 
he was not going to be able to participate in the Sanhedrin and go to the Passover deal and celebrate any of those things. He wasn't going to be able to do that because he was unclean. So whenever you identify with Jesus, it gets dirty. Now, dirty is not necessarily like, you know, mud and stuff like that, but you're unclean according to the Bible. And he knew what he was about to do. This was the high holy time of the year. This was a time when, when it was big time. And he was one of the people, and so therefore they were watching him, and people who he influ had influence over, people that would respect him, would say, you should do anything to get yourself unclean because you're not going to be able to participate, and so on and so forth. And so there it was. Sometimes when you identify with Jesus, you get your hands dirty. You get messed up in things where people, like I said before, hate you, people will avoid you, you won't be allowed to participate. You see, if you're a Christian, an evangelical Christian who believes that you need to share the truth, there are many rules and regulations in the workplace and other places that says that's, that's, uh, that's against the law. And so sometimes you're going to get your hands dirty. You're going to be excluded. You're going to be put out. You're going to be set aside. It might be that. Uh, those things could happen. And the, the government and participates and other people who desire, desire to have nothing. To, you see, if you can't stop a person. See, here's the deal. If you're trying to tell people about Jesus, you want to help people understand, look, I was like you. I was lost without hope. I had problems, whatever words that they might identify with. Well, you know, I've got this terrible problem. I feel like I'm not complete. I feel like I'm not whole. I feel like I'm at unease. I feel like I'm... Uh, you know, constantly in conflict all the time. Let me tell you something. Ultimately, at the bottom of that, many cases, it's it, actually the Bible says it's because we don't have peace with God. And so we don't have peace with God, then we will find ourselves in our life many times without peace. Now, that doesn't mean if you not have peace in your heart that you don't have peace with God. I mean, help you out here for a second. Because it is a fact, does not, and, and, and that God says, I've got an answer for that, does not mean that because I've come to God and said, God, forgive me, and God says, I forgive you, God, help me, God says, I'm helping you, that you ain't still going to have those kind of problems. You're not still going to have those doubts. If, if you doubt, ask God. See, don't ask your neighbor. Don't ask somebody else. Ask God. Ask them, then God may say, go ask somebody. Here's a person to ask. Ask them. They may be their faithful Christian who at that moment in time, if God told you to ask them, then you're asking them because God told you to. And you know what? They may not know it, but God's going to help them help you. God's going to give them an answer of some sort. He's going to help them to encourage you and guide you. So here it is. He's, he, you know, this is one of those things. You get your hands dirty. You know what Joseph did? Joseph said, you know, I'm going to I'm gonna take, I know I'm going to be unclean. I know the, the guy, the gang, the crew I hang out with, they're not going to let me come back to Sanhedrin for seven days. They're probably not even going to ever let me. I might be risking my neck, and that might be true. I, I, I know people are going to suddenly lose respect for me. They're suddenly going to change. They're going to treat me different. They're going to treat me like an outcast. They're going to treat me as somebody outside because I have done something that they consider to be wrong and I've done something that they said, you know, this is no longer and so I've done it and it's going to be, it's going to be a problem. Not only that, so he's got a social problem, if you will, but he's also got a money problem too. Well, I say that. It can be expensive. Guess what? Now, you don't see it here in these details, but I can assure you that the other gospel writers indicated that there was there is a need. This this tomb cost money. Now they, I'm not pointing that. Only rich people can afford the kind of operation that that Joseph had. To have a hewn tomb big enough for the whole body to be laying in was a big thing. Imagine now we've got to cut a spot out of a rock where it's big enough for somebody to be laid out horizontally in it, and don't forget that the other people went in there later and saw also this cost a lot of money because it was manpower intensive and it was real estate lord have mercy on us all does not anybody know real estate costs a lot of money i don't care where it is it's expensive so joseph had this he had it close by why 
Well, then he wasn't in Arimathea, but it was too far necessarily for him. If he died in Jerusalem during serving on the Sanhedrin, he would need to be died, buried in the same day, according to Jewish custom, to, to avoid all kinds of things. And so guess what? To do that, he wanted, he, he had, probably he probably had a tomb back in Arimathea. But anyway, he had one made for himself in uh, Jerusalem and probably for any family that he had. That would have been the custom. And so this was a big money operation. It's huge. And he wrapped him in a linen cloth. This was expensive cloth. cloth. And we know that there were spices and things that were brought that were just, he didn't just wrap them up in a rag and stick them in a hole. There was a necessary operation here, a burial procedure that all had to be done in a very short period of time. And this stuff, expensive, is beyond imagination expensive. It costs a lot of money in Jerusalem time, in first century time. Joseph was a rich man. The Bible says he was, and rich was big time. If anybody doesn't think that it's expensive to die, then you haven't been paying any attention. I did a quick scan to find out what the average cost of a funeral is, and average cost of funeral somewhere between ten and twenty thousand dollars. That's average person on the higher side of that for typical, and it can be way more than that. That's just you know going getting by, right? That's a big sum of money for most average people to spend. Uh, to bury somebody who's dead. Joseph had the funds. He had, and he had to cough up some funds to come up with this kind of stuff. Especially, look at here's short notice thing. This all had to be procured. All had to be got. There's a lot of money involved in this. And so, what I mean by that is, what's that got to do with me? Well, here's the thing. You identify with Jesus, they're going to hate you. They're going to. It's going to be. It's going to be something that's socially and culturally uh, risky. It's also going to be something that you can. You're going to get. Uh, you know, kicked out of places. You're going to be considered unclean, if you will, ostracized. And it can be expensive because if you lose your job, if you if you lose uh, some uh, thing because you no longer can participate, and that's that's something you have. This is all expensive stuff. It's all something that, that's with, and if you haven't been given nothing to the Lord's work or the Bible, there's a tithe to be given and some sort of offering to be given. You haven't done any of that. Well, guess what? That gets to be expensive considering you wasn't doing it before. And whatever you're spending that money on, you're not spending it now because you're giving to God, and, you know, happily and, and merrily and joyfully, by the way, right? So that costs something. There's some material thing here to think about. And Joseph was spending money and energy and time and all of that. That was part of the package here. It was a big risk he was taking in lots of different ways. First of all, I also mentioned socially, and I kind of mentioned that all through this, and culturally. He got booted out of the Sanhedrin, I'm absolutely certain of that. He was kicked out, no longer welcome there because he was, he was anathema. He was outside their view system. Now that he got booted out, you could have get booted out of your club, your religious organization. You know, you can boot, get booted out of your job. You can get booted, booted out of your social circle. That's what more people care about than anything else. It's maybe their job. You can get booted out of your family, which is ultimately the great boot out. I mean, that's getting uninvited. The modern word would be canceled. <laughs> I don't know if you know this or not, but we've all been canceled. That's what they said on television. People woke up. I heard that. And, I, and the next thing I read was we were canceled. I'm thinking, why didn't they just stay in bed? I thought that's what they were doing anyway, sleeping in the basement. But anyhow, all those people who woke up suddenly canceled all the rest of us who weren't. <laughs> Always like that, you know. But the point is, this is going on today. If you, if you know that because we met, putting this on tape here and on video is probably risky, but I'm going to say because we did, it was not against the law here in Florida to meet and churches uh, every Sunday before the woohoo virus came along and since the woohoo virus came up, we've been meeting here every Sunday like we always did. And I'm sure that that has created some sort of cultural, you know, backlash in lots of places around the country. It's been illegal. It's cr crime caused the lawyers to be involved, fines, and still is and likely to happen again. 
So when you are trying to worship God and trying to do what you can, you can find yourself outcast. How many people, I'm not asking for a show of hands here, but I think all of us can find that people have in our families have rejected us because of our beliefs that are biblically based and because of our Christian stands. And that is a expensive because, you know, when all the other stuff settles, sometimes that's it. I've heard people say, when you don't have nothing else, you have family. <laughs> I'm glad to know that my family is pretty big. It's real big. Matter of fact, I got family I never met. I got family I'm going to meet someday. I've got a lot of family. Because the, the church of the living Lord is large. Talks about millennia, millennia millions and millions of people. Word, they didn't have a word bigger than a thousand, and uh, you know, so they had thousands upon thousands. Uh, you know, so I've got a big family. That don't mean I don't care about my other family, but you know what? I got if I got to choose Jesus or them, I got to choose some belief system, some sort of thing to them. Then I'm gonna have to choose Jesus, cause I don't want to be, I don't want to sound wrong here, and you know, and I do have a, a way of doing that, I guess. But let me tell you something. Long after they're gone, Jesus will still be. Jesus will still be. When they can't do nothing for me, won't do nothing for me, Jesus is always taking care of me. But guess what? All those dangerous things, and you know what one of them is? You always think you're the lonely guy, right? We could talk about Elijah and other people in the Old Testament, but guess what? You think like you're the only one. I bet you when Paul was down in one of them jails, he thought he was the only one. I bet when Paul, I bet there was times when he got kind of lonesome down there. But let me tell you something. This wasn't, the, Joseph wasn't by himself. I got good news for you. You know what? Them two women was there and they were instrumental in doing some of that spice and stuff and some of that things that was going on. You know who else was there? Another disciple, Nicodemus. Nicodemus was there. Nicodemus, it says, brought the stuff. The women got the stuff from they, they did. This was an operation. This turned out not to be. But when you think you're all alone, there's all of a sudden God has some people. Just like in the Old Testament, he talks about the prophets. I, you think you're all, I got this one, I got these, I got these over here, I got these over there. They're always somebody. God's got plenty of people. You're not alone. If you got Jesus, you ain't never alone. Good news is this morning. If you don't got Jesus, pardon me for that poor English, but I've probably got plenty of other ones, is that you can have him. You know what? He still is inviting people. He's still asking, won't you come and join me at the cross? Won't you come and join me at the tomb? Won't you come and join me at the celebration? Won't you come and join me in the resurrection? Won't you come and be a part of that? Won't you trust me? I'll never leave you or forsake you. That's strong words. We like to throw those words around a lot of times, but you know what? Jesus is the only one who can keep it. I don't think any of us want to be forsaken or left. Great tragedy, terrible thing. Sometimes we can't help it because people die. However, Jesus never leave us. Never leave us. He's always there and you can have him this morning. You can count on Jesus, you know what? And he's got a lot of disciples. He's got a lot of people come to help him. He's got a lot of people praying. He's got a lot of people working. He's got people I never met. I may never meet there. But they're there. There's a lot of people. God's always there. He's always helping. So if you're worried about getting tangled up, well, don't worry about it. It's a fact. It's probably going to happen. It probably has happened. Maybe probably everybody in here has probably heard had something happen to him like that. But Jesus has not forgotten. And if you feel like you're left alone by your problems and your cares and the world is abandoning you and you feel abandoned, you feel hopeless, you feel lost without hope in the world, then now, you're, now you understand what sin does. And Jesus says, I'll forgive it. Bring it to me. Tell me all about it, your cares. Cast your cares on me because I care for you, Jesus. Would you do that this morning? Would you pray with me? Lord, this morning, we all have cares and burdens. Those who don't know you certainly 
have that great burden of sin that's accumulated all their life, the burden of unrest in their heart and their soul. We try to cover it up. We try to anesthetize it. We try to act like it isn't there. We try to do something. We try to all this stuff, and nothing seems to work. Only you, Lord, can fill that spot. Only you can take that away. I pray for them this morning, Lord, to come to know you as Lord and Savior. I pray for us, Lord, this morning who claim to know you, who believe that you're our Lord and Savior and confess our sins to you, follow you, believers' baptism, Lord, that we this morning recognize that we have days, we have moments. Lord, let's just be truthful. We might have weeks. You've never left us. Let's just go ahead and say the truth. You said you wouldn't and you haven't. Maybe we've left you. Maybe we forgot your phone number. Maybe we forgot to call you. Maybe we ought to open the Bible up and read how much you love us, how much you care us, and how, how much you care for us, and how much and how close you are to us. Maybe we just need to ask. Maybe we need to confess. Lord, this morning we pray that you would have your way in our heart. For we certainly know what we need what we want, what we lack. And you, Lord, know even better than that. And if we miss something, you'll be glad to tell it to us. And, Lord, forgive us. I ask this in Jesus' name this morning. Amen.